computer. Okay, so we're working our way through the Ku book and we're now up to flammability properties with properties. Now, some of the thermal properties were things like decomposition stuff. This is specifically looking at flammability. So how do you inhibit flammability? So uh, in the case of polymers, we're talking about solid combustion, okay? So the act of solid combustion actually is, has three distinct and overlapping uh, phases. The first thing is the preheat phase because the solid itself doesn't melt. Flame is a vapor phase reaction. So what you have to do is you have to uh, get that unburned fuel heated up enough to catch fire and or produce flammable gases that are evolved from that system. So you have to have enough heat there long enough to decompose enough things in the small molecules to get it into the gas phase and start burning. Once you start burning, that's great because now the actual fire has black body radiation reading back to help, help promote heat, which takes it to the distillation phase or gas use phase. That's where you're starting to thermally decompose the solid material, and that solid material is generating small molecules, which can diffuse out and burn in the gas phase. Now, the last phase is the charcoal or solid phase, and this is where most of the flammable gases are gone or in too low a, a concentration to sustain flame. And then you have the charred fuel that doesn't burn rapidly. Sometimes it'll actually go out. Sometimes it'll have enough residual heat to smolder, okay? And then if it comes in close with something else, it'll do that. But it's not exactly that simple. There's a lot of things going on all at once. And this is, the, this is not the diagram I was looking for. I was looking for a much more complex diagram. But we have the idea that we have this heat from an emission source that causes thermal oxidation, which produces heat and produces thermal degradation. Thermal degradation is where you generate your vapor phase components. Now your vapor phase components can now uh, volatilize out of the material and get into the gas phase and start burning. Okay, that we're burning that thermal oxidation in the flame area actually produces heat, which leads to thermal degradation and thermal oxidation. Now, whatever doesn't get to be made into gaseous materials here can be contributing to the char layer or the thermal oxidation can be contributing to the char layer. Now notice this boundary here. The, as you know, you're not gonna build up a char layer immediately. You're gonna have to burn through so much of your material to generate that char layer. Once you generate that char layer, the char layer's actual benefit is to reflect the heat. So it actually starts uh, decreasing the heat transfer. And then we have the, uh, the products are just, you know, CO2 and uh, carbon monoxide and water and stuff like that. So we actually have this really myriad of things having to go on, but key things that have to happen are you need to either cool your system down, create a char layer, or uh, in the case of uh, some of them, you can actually have it so you actually have materials that don't actually produce gases at all. And so think about uh, like graphene or high aromatic polymers, they don't burn at all. And polycarbonate actually doesn't burn very well either. It has a lot of benzene in it as well. Okay. So when we're talking about our polymer nanocomposites and FR stands for flame retardant, okay? Flame retardant, we're gonna talk about it in three different zones, both broken into three different zones. One, one D materials, so our plenty stuff, 2D materials, our nanotubes, and then 3D materials typically is going to be our uh, silica, aluminum, or magnesium hydroxide. Now, the, each of these different components actually contributes to stopping the fire in a different way. Okay. So there are several different things we can use as reactive or additive flame retardants. Reactive ones are ones that will react to form something that makes the reaction not happen, or we can actually. So the top of the list is minerals. So think about montmorillonite, that's a great one to use, but there's also magnesium hydroxide. A lot of borate compounds are used in this system. The boron gets oxidized to boric acid, and then that acts as a layer in molten, non-combustible layer. Uh, hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide give off water, which is cooling. So it actually changes the temperature of your system. In the organohalogens here, there's a whole bunch of these are used, but they're they're going to be phased out eventually because of environmental damage. Uh, the natural ones here are, you know, pretty inexpensive and easy to use because they're 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 pretty common. These are going to be phased out because of their environmental persistence and effect on the ozone. 
The next set is actually a very popular one, these organophosphates. These organophosphates are really cool, especially the tetraphenylphosphate and some of the other ones with phenyl rings on them, because number one, they don't burn very well, but when they burn, they produce phosphine oxides or phosphoric acid, which acts as a quenching agent on the surface. So that's kind of cool. And then you can kind of try to, you know, straddle the fence and say, okay, I'm going to do halogens too, because halogens work in a different way, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, and the phosphorus works making an impermeable layer, not a charred layer, but an impermeable layer. And then the last thing we have is organic compound. Actually, drop that off here. All right, thank you. All right. So, and then some things like your uh, carboxylic acids actually will decarbonylate, liberate a gas that's non combustible. So you can actually use loadings of that as well. Okay, so let's talk about the different mechanisms. The first mechanism I want to talk about is an endothermic degradation, meaning that when it reacts, it absorbs heat. As it's absorbing heat, heat cannot transfer into the main material to generate volatile materials, and therefore your combustion stops. Okay, these are very commonly used in the aluminum and magnesium hydroxides and uh, with uh, carbonates uh, like calcium carbonate and or uh, other hydrates, you also get CO2, uh, which absorbs heat as it volatilizes. So the whole point is to remove heat from the substrate, therefore cooling, therefore quenching. Okay, so uh, all of these hydrates and hydroxides are, have a relatively low decomposition temperature. And they tend to have really high loading, you know, 50, 60, 70% by weight. Okay. But uh, once you, uh, if you're trying to uh, twin screw extrude them, you're going to have some issues because you have to go use the lowest temperature absolutely possible because it'll start to dehydrate in like above 180 degrees C. So you have to be very careful with your reaction parameters when you're trying to get that material into your process. The next one is what we call thermal shielding. Okay. Thermal shielding is great. That's where you're creating the char layer. And you're creating a char layer that does two things. It reflects heat back, as well as stops oxygen from permeating in and helps stop the thermal oxidation. So by stopping the spread over the surface of the material, it acts as a thermal insulation between the burn and the burn parts. Into mesons, into mesent additives are things that form char layer by expanding or, or, or non-combustible materials. And their role is to turn the polymer surface into char. Okay, so they're going to expand and then uh, fuse together so that it doesn't allow you to char. So that separates the flame from the material because remember, the flame is above the material, radiating heat back. Okay, so it slows that heat transfer to the unburned fuel. Okay, and then for non halogen organic and inorganic phosphates, right there, the main thing that happens is phosphorus really loves oxygen. Phosphates tend to only have one oxygen on them. Sometimes they're phosphate esters and they'll have three oxygens on them, but it's going to decompose to get five oxygens total to give us a phosphoric acid, a charred phosphoric acid. Now, phosphoric acid is a very is not the strongest of acid, but it will also uh, wet the surface in, in the molten phase here and act as a, a barrier as well. Okay, so we have endothermic, we have thermal shielding, and we have now dilution of the gas phase. This is where CO2 or things that uh, produce CO2 like carbonates and or carboxylic acids work well. What they do is you're going to pump out CO2 or water, which can burn, and therefore that kind of spreads the gas molecule, spreads the combustible materials out, making it have to uh, migrate further before it can actually combust. So this helps to uh, lower the, the, the um, basically the effective concentration of oxygen. If you're lowering the effective concentration of oxygen, you're going to lower the flame spread rate. Okay. So now we can dilute it with gases. So this is also used in a lot of things where uh, we have nitrogen generators like tetrazoles, amino tetrazoles. Those are used in airbags. Uh, airbags use a, a kind of a dynamal material that gives off a huge amount of nitrogen. And that would also do a, a gas phase dilution system as well. Okay. Now there's gas phase radical quenching. 
Turns out some of the more reactive species inside your plant, they're like hydroxide radicals, hydrogen radicals, and they're very short lived and they add to spreading uh, these highly energetic materials. When you do it, they go undergo thermal degradation, giving HCl or HDR right here. And sometimes that's catalyzed by adding a, a, a tiny amount, like 0.3% of the antimony compound. Then when they react and get in that vapor phase, they turn into chloride radical and bromide radical. Which are much longer lived. Okay, that slows the propagation of radicals down. Therefore, it slows the flame down as well. Okay, so we have the reason that this is that it's not going to propagate by uh, radical oxidation, so it slows the combustion system. So that's how the halogenated systems work. All right. So questions on our different types of flame retardants. Uh, we're going to do everything but the uh, gas phase quenching here. Uh, we're going to do, you know, an endothermic. We're going to do char, and we're going to. Oh, we're not doing gas. So we're going to do predominantly the endothermic and char are the two major mechanisms that we'll be studying with our nanocomposites in this set today. That's still like, you know, all the radicals versus the halogens are still like safe. Um. Well, uh, safe. It's safe for us, or safe, safe for the ozone. <laughs> so, well, see, that's where they're starting to phase out because when they actually do get used, they will be volatilized as a gaseous product, and they are very long lived as you know, the CFCs and other things. So, if they get in the upper atmosphere, they will kill us. So, that's why one of the reasons they're phasing out. Plus, a lot of them are aromatic uh, polyhalogens, and those are environmental persistent. Up, basically, if they get released into the air and water, there is not no microbes. Are the halogenated ones the best? Um, no, I think the phosphates. I mean, it depends on on what you're trying to do. The phosphates work really well for things like fabrics of paper uh, and plastics like PVC. The, the magnesium oxide, hydroxides, and stuff that works really well in thermosets. Or in rubbery things because it's going to make it tougher. Uh, the um, the gas generators work for things where you're going to be out in the open and you can have the expanding gas on. So they're not necessarily the best, but they are common. I think they're being phased out for the borates and the uh, phosphates. Okay, so for our testing. Um, we, we will see some TGA and stuff like that. It's of course, x rays and T cam and stuff like that. But the real value here is things like vertical flame test, which I'll describe and actually have a video. Uh, and then char yield. Char yield is important if you're looking for that barrier making a char layer system. So you're looking for char yield. How big is it and how fast does it form? What temperature can it form at? And then cold calorimetry, we've already talked about. And that's how much heat it gets off when it's burning, well, both its peak heat release and its average or total peak, total release. So, because we've already talked about combing calorimetry, I'm just going to remind you that we have a sample here. We can do three different things here. We're going to look at the sustained heating uh, as, as it's being exposed to a certain amount of heat flux. We're going to also look at that peak heat rise. And then we're also going to look for our, how much smoke is given off. And so uh, in, the, in these results, we're actually just looking at the, the heat, the peak heat release and the total heat release. And of course, we're looking for this, where did my, there, we're looking for our thing to look like this. When we're charring, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for it to heat up and then that char layer is insulating and just slows everything down. And go there. So what we should see in almost all of these is this kind of peak here, because uh, the, the cone calorimetry works for that kind of char level. Okay. So then char yield is done by TGA. So we can just do 10 degrees a minute and figure out how much material is left in the pan by how much stuff you have. There's another isometric version of this where you can actually look at thermal degradation up over time as well. But this is the primary way in which you get charred. 
Okay. And then you can actually sometimes analyze the char afterwards to see what the major components are. Okay. Another system that uh, I didn't mention there was limiting oxygen index. Okay. Limiting oxygen index tells us what minimum uh, percentage of oxygen is required to burn that uh, material. So, you know, our, our you know, atmosphere is 21. So if it burns an atmosphere, you know, that's, that's not good. Well, it turns out that you can uh, put your sample in here and you start it burning and then you have a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and slowly, while not changing the flow, decrease the amount of oxygen. Or, I'm sorry, keep increasing. Oh, yeah, so if you keep increasing the amount of oxygen to see where it will sustain a burn. Let's say you have a material that doesn't really burn in, in, in the atmosphere. You keep raising the oxygen content until it will sustain a flame. Okay, so things like Capton, you have to have a 32% oxygen to a 35% oxygen in your air to have it sustain combustion. Okay, so that's you know a good 10, 15 percent more than the atmosphere. So that's showing you the higher the number, the better. So if you have to get like 90% oxygen to sustain your burn, that's a really non-burnable. But you know, even metals don't make the 90%. So and I'll tell you that when I do the nano energetics. And then of course we have the UL94V. UL94V is great because it gives a real world thing. You're actually taking it, heating it. And I'm gonna show you a video. I think, oh no, I don't have, okay. I'm gonna have to show you the video on here. Uh, I forgot I converted it into a PDF file, and then that means I think it's this one. Okay, so let's skip add and then turn the sound on. Vertical flame test is a material characterization standard for determining the flammability of a plastic. This instructional video will cover safety, items, and equipment required, setup, procedure, and analysis of a vertical flame test. This instructional video is intended for engineering students who have completed the intro to plastics and composites, materials, and processes. While working in the lab, you will need to wear safety glasses and conducting a vertical flame to properly display your identification badge. You this will that? ensure the safety and security of the labs. While working around open flames to high temperature materials, heat protective gloves should be worn. Warning, while conducting a vertical flame test, volatiles can be released into the air. It is required to wear a respirator during any testing. Get a lab technician's approval before conducting any vertical flame no tests. Before starting the test, you will need a working hood, cotton balls, Bunsen burner, clamp stand, heat so gloves, a respirator, a timer, a ruler, a striker, um, aluminum foil, and, and your sample you specimen. An optional metal windshield may also be used. Test um, specimens should, should be 125 millimeters long, 13 millimeters wide, and between 3 and 13 so millimeters thick. The fume uh, hood can be located in the measurements and analysis lab immediately on the right. Heat gloves can be found outside the door to the left at the roto molding station. Strikers can be found to the left of the fume hood on the wall. Ask a lab technician to get a Bunsen burner and a clamp stand. So, to start setup, turn on the hood lights and ventilation. The switches can be located on the front of the hood to the left. Lay down some aluminum foil to make sure the workspace stays clean for other students. Attach the Bunsen burner hose to the blue natural gas nozzle located on the left of the fume hood. Spread out cotton balls directly underneath where the specimen will burn. The cotton balls are used to indicate the flammability of any drips that come off of the specimen as it burns. Set up the ring stand so that it is directly above the Bunsen burner. Attach the specimen to the ring stand. Adjust its height so that it will sit 10 millimeters above the top of the Bunsen burner. Once ready, 
Turn on the natural gas to the Bunsen burner by rotating the blue nozzle counterclockwise. Use the striker to ignite the Bunsen burner. Once lit, adjust the Bunsen burner flame until it is blue and about 20 millimeters tall. See how they had it where the sample pivots into and out of? Because you pivoted in weight. Before starting the test, verify that the flame is 20 millimeters tall. Also, make sure the hood door is as low as possible. Once ready, apply the flame to the center of the specimen at the bottom, ensuring half the flame, or roughly 10 millimeters, is making contact with the specimen. Hold the flame on the specimen for 10 seconds, starting once the flame has made contact. It helps to have another person time while doing this. After 10 seconds, remove the specimen from the flame and hold it over the cotton balls. Time how long it takes for the flame to extinguish. Record this as after flame time one. Also, make a note if any drips coming off the specimen light the cotton balls on fire. Once the flame extinguishes, reapply the flame for another 10 seconds. You actually have to do it twice to get a full cast. After 10 seconds, remove the specimen from the flame. Close the working head door completely as the specimen burns. Record how long it takes for the flame to extinguish. Record this time as after flame two. Wait for the specimen to stop burning before cleaning up your workspace. After following the proper flammability testing procedure, the next step is to analyze the results. Three categories in the UL94 vertical flame test are V0, V1, and V2. In order to achieve the lowest flammability classification V0, the after flame time one and the after flame time two must be less than 10 seconds. The flame cannot reach the top of the specimen while being burnt, and the cotton indicators cannot be ignited during testing. For more information, read the UL94 testing standard. Okay. So let's go back to. Do you love Gantt charts? Oops. Here's how easily you can build one. Yes, I love Gantt charts. Let's map out the. All right. So, anyway. Okay, so in this right here, what we're looking for, of course, is the idea that um, it either self extinguishes very quickly or it doesn't drip. Those are, those are really important things. If it's anything less than that, it's considered a fail. There, there's only technically zero, one, and two, and then technically people have three, five, four, and five, but nobody wants to. Was that, that, was, that demonstration was a uh, No, that was just a composite. That's just right. Yeah, and did you notice the first 10 seconds it didn't catch fire immediately the extinguished right here? So why did you have why is the second? Because the thermal oxidation under the barrier that we set. Exactly. We, whatever uh, there wasn't enough heat flux to get enough of the things volatilizing to get it to sustain combustion. Okay, so that first 10 seconds gives you some idea if you have enough heat flux to start thermal oxidation. In there and then it starts burning right away and then of course if you have something like polypropylene it's going to melt flaming balls down cotton balls can't have fire. Okay. so the second that's why the second test is important because you're seeing you pre-warmed it basically now you're seeing you have just fire again how long are you supposed to wait um it's yes yeah, 10 seconds 10 seconds yeah, you can't wait too long or else it'll cool down. So, okay, so we're going to start first with the one dimensional. So, we're going to start with the clays. The most common clay used are mothmorillonites. Most of them are in the clothesite family. Uh, so, they'll probably be pretty good to use. Uh, and because there's just so easy to get, because, you know, Gonzalez actually has a, a mine where they just pull it out of the ground and modify it and ship it out by the time. Okay, so it is really, really uh, a good low cost material and it actually does a good job in this especially making char layers so the first thing i want to talk about is the heat release here of this uh, nylon and uh, it's actually a nylon 11. so it's a total of 11 carbons in the chain uh, and so then they put in different little things they put in the flame retardant additive that they normally use and this one is uh, i want to say it's a phosphate Thing I have in my but then they added uh, carbon nanotubes right here, nano clay, uh, carbon nanofibers. Okay, so in the case of the carbon, the neat material, that's this first curve here. We see it just burns very quickly. 
Okay, very high heat release, 1200, and it's completely combusted in under 200 seconds. Okay, and the second one here is just the flame of that, uh, the uh, uh, flame retardant. We have a lower onset here, a lower peak, but it converts longer. But it's not that nice, deep sloping curve. Look at this right here. In the case of the uh, carb, the nanoclays right here, we're getting those nice little things. It has a slight peak and continuous downrise. So the nanoclay is getting the perfect cone calorimetry spring. But look at this. The nanofibers, the carbon nanofibers, have a slower onset. And in that, it has a lower peak heat, but then it continues to burn for a little longer. Okay, why? What's the difference between the nanoclay and the carbon fibers? Fire faster fuel fibers. True. Persistent length flip just leads to thermal conductivity, heat transfer. These are creating a char layer right at the top. These, well, they're not burning, they're diffusing the heat, so it takes longer for it to combust. They're diffusing the heat, but by the time you get, you know, all the heat transferred, it's going to take longer to burn it all, because now it has enough heat flux here to take more burning. So here we're creating a char layer and stopping a little bit. Here we're limiting onset. <clears throat> so yeah, yeah. Oh. The uh, heat release rate is what we consider a flammability property because it's the maximum amount of heat. So there's two there's the total heat release, and then there's the peak heat release. Now, the reason we're looking for a lower heat release is if it has a low heat release, it's less likely to catch other things on fire. Okay. So, it is a it, we typically use it in a flammability. Because in a thermal property, what you're looking for is our, you know, usually it's a more, is it mechanically more structured as I, as I raise the temperature or lower temperature. Okay. okay. So now let's take another platy clay and use it into an epoxy. So in this case here, with just epoxy by itself, right here we have the, uh, this is the lysinidyl bisphenol A. And then this is the other one I forgot. It's, it's a different uh, epoxy system, but this is the bisphenol system, and this is not. And if you look at it, that the bisphenol system here actually has a, a higher char yield than this one because this is more aliphatic, more aliphatic system. This has more benzene rings in it, and therefore it has a higher char yield than that. Okay, so it starts at about 15 to uh, to 25 percent. And then just adding a phosphate flame retardant system here, you can actually increase it up to around 45 right there, but you have a phosphate added in your system. Now, switching over and doing just 7.5% clay and no phosphate ester here, you get about the same thing. You get about a 40 to 45% charge. So just the clay itself is, is helping there. And again, this 7.5, so it's not just all clay, the clay is of not allowing volatile gases to permeate out and creating a nice char layer on the top that has also trapped organic material. Because it's not just 7.5 better, it's actually keeping some of the organic material from burning, therefore giving us a larger char layer. And then by adding 3% phosphate with that, we don't see the same performance right here. Okay, phosphate's not helping us. Phosphate's actually inhibiting uh, in the case of the allopathic one. But it's actually synergistic in the aromatic system. So we have an interesting uh, uh, additive. So, you know, and it's pretty easy to get 7.5% uh, clay dispersed evenly into an epoxy resin because you pick the low viscosity section and stir it up a high shear for a few, like 30 minutes, and then add your catalyst. Okay. So, in this right here, in addition to that graph there, I went to look at the paper and they reported that the um, the um, oxygen index. Oh, 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 I have a question. I'm sorry, I was oh, sorry. Um, you said that the epoxy would naturally 
uh, the, it, things with aromatic rings tend to charm more. Yes. I guess that did we discuss it? Uh, why is that? Uh, they're harder to oxidize. And so, uh, for example, uh, if you burn um, like, okay, polycarbonate, which is like this on a based system right there, is considered non combustible or pretty hard to start fire on polyethylene or immediately. So that's an allotype or something like that. There's a polyparaphenylene that actually doesn't even start with the six degrees. I might find a better explanation for you. I'll, I'll look that up. But, uh, but it is it's relative. Yeah, it, it, it's, they are harder to oxidize, therefore, they're harder to get out gas and from and harder to generate. And then, if you can think about it, they almost graphitize. Yeah, and that's how we get our charm there. Um, so, limiting oxygen index, thank you, Jimmy Pence, for that. Uh, went from 25%. Which is just over atmospheric, up to 32 or 34 percent with the adding of the dynamic clay to it. So uh, that's actually a bigger change than most people see because, again, the limiting oxygen index is just how the polymer matrix burns, but it does show an important value there. Now, with the tetrafunctional one with fewer benzene rings, it actually helps as well. It started at 26 and went up to 35. So that's actually pretty decent in the fact that they, they do. Usually it's not that big a deal for that. And then the mass rate loss, which is another thing you can get from uh, the uh, cone calorimetry, actually was improved, was decreased by 40%. So the heat, peak heat release was lower, the total heat release was lower, and that mass loss rate was decreased by 40%. By and then they saw that the uh, heat of combustion, smoke, and carbon monoxide levels were unchanged. So remember, we get smoke steering from the carbon monoxide. So that means that we're not looking at a, at a catalytic or non catalytic mechanism, we're looking at a barrier mechanism. Everything else is the same. Okay, so let's move over to elastomers. And these are thermoplastic elastomers. And they were done with clay loadings up to 10% using a twin screw extruder. And I just wanted to show you another twin screw extruder showing that we have the polymer feeds here and then starts to melt. And then we have our solid feed here. And then this is our liquid mixing and high shear cones, degassing and followed by extrusion. So. Okay. So what they saw from just the um, wide angle scattering here is that they got melt first. Even at the low levels right here, uh, uh, two, five, seven, uh, half to 10. So we're starting to see a little bit of aggregation in the 10%, but still it's pretty good uh, dispersed there. And if you look at the SEMs, they, ITEMs, they agree. And we get really good dispersion here, nice, uh, no clumping here. It's starting to get a little bit of clumping here at the 10%. But that's kind of expected because you don't have enough polymer to strip it out. Okay, so let's look at their um, heat release rates for this right here. Uh, the pure polymer right here, uh, kind of, it actually kind of melt flows and then really combusts and then kind of has a slight char here. But notice the one with the 5% flow site right here. Perfect, it's D sloping all the way down. Down and the one with the other one with the side of it was not quite as good, but it had a lower heat rise, lower peak heat too. This one had the perfect slope. This one had a really slowing effect, a little bit of a late burn, but a higher charge. Notice that there's mass there. So, so. oh, that's just you no. Know, they're still getting out heat for a long period of time. Okay. So what about graphene? What can we do with graphene? This is also in the book. These guys did uh, graphene and epoxy. And so we can compare this directly to the clay because the clay was low thermal conductivity and non combustible Graphene is really hard to combust because of the elasticity. And so the neat material itself right here had a huge peak heat release, okay? 2,200, that's in kilowatts per square meter. 
Uh, just 5% of the flow site takes down 664, which is a 70% reduction here. Uh, the neat other polymer, notice there's a big difference just in polymers itself. 5% that took it down to under 500, out 500, which is 50. So what that means is that if we look at the average heat release, we get a significant change in this one here, even though it's only heat that's different. And then the average release after 180 seconds is still lower for the, the so the average uh, efficiency of heat from the tree is also affected. They're both uh, in about the same range. Okay, so let's move over to a different system and I'm going to do a little more detail in this one. This one we're going to look at um, high impact polystyrene. Okay, so high impact polystyrene is a slightly different word. They play with the structure a little bit, so they have that. We're going to use uh, one to ten percent of graphene oxide. It should disperse fairly well. Uh, they looked at the. They saw that as they increased it. They had the uh, total heat rate, heat release, go down from uh, 37 kilojoules to 34 kilojoules. So, you know, that doesn't seem like much, it's about a 10% reduction, but it's probably not as good as some of the other. The peaks were also dropped about 28%. The char yield was increased 500%. 1% does 6%. So here, 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 you know, hey, you know, it's results, but uh, I wouldn't consider that a massive change in char yield. You really want your char yield to be, you know, 10, 30, 40, 50 percent. The higher the char yield, the better, because you're not just looking at your char yield. What you're looking at is that that char layer is actually a virgin material below. It. Okay, so your char yield is not that high. No, this is not. I mean, what they said. <laughs> And you know the the high uh, high impact polysaccharide is actually very flammable, and they found the graphene oxide did not help the virgin materials to fail the Okay, uh, not only does it drip, uh, and, but it also combusts. And the aliphatic section is off gassing tremendously, so off gas is enough to have this aromatic section that actually starts to combust. Notice that because you can see this, it, or just at least volatilize, it volatilizes the benzene. Whereas when you have a structure, it's usually will help. So this result is unrealistic, or um, it cannot be. No, this is this is not unrealistic, but it's it didn't help enough to make this material commercially. I, I this there's nothing here that says, hey, I want to buy this. The, the improvements are not good enough. So why they're using it as we all know that plastic is is highly um, well, it's because it's high impact polystyrene, it's used in like uh, non non glass uh, windows and stuff like that. It's, it's a good material for what it does. I mean, imagine you know, you know snowmobile cows and stuff like that, and it's in a high impact polystyrene. Okay. It's so, so, so it competes with like polycarbonate. I think it's high density. Yeah. Um, I used to, I thought it's a, they, they do a, it's either syndiotactic or atactic or isotactic. They, they get it in a structure, so it's actually, uh, uh, it has better impact properties than normal styrene. So, okay. So, I, I should have looked that up. I didn't. I'm sorry. I, I, I know that there is something different about the way they polymerize it so that it, it actually has better properties. Okay. So here's another good thing of an impact material here is ADS, which is a fairly nice trial view by styrene right here. What they saw from increasing it from one to 10% is they saw a decrease in total heat release, a decrease in the heat, heat, heat release, and an increase in the char yield. Again, 600%, um, you know, it was it went from two to seven. <laughs> As right here. Uh, they did all exhibit dripping under flame tests. Okay, so that means they failed to do an improvement on the 
just a little bit of fever leaks is not going to help you sell you the product. But they also found that their the, the self-extinguishing fire was also preserved. There is still no correlation between flame retardancy and flammability in the system. So the graphene oxide, well, it did improve some properties, it didn't improve other properties, and therefore it's like eh, it's a nut. Hey, it was a paper, I got it on my Tuesday. But that was their, their conclusion. I have a question. Yes. Is the is the dripping prevented primarily by charring? Um, if your char and uh, it acts as an encapsulant, yes. The dripping is mostly done by the melting point of the polymer. Okay. Uh, and so if your heat flux is enough to melt polymer, then it's going to flow. Okay. So now let's go to polycarbonate. Polycarbonate is not very flammable, uh, but we had the graphene oxide here. We see again a modest change in the total heat and peak heat release, uh, but again, not very much. So you can imagine how it burned. Char yield was increased 21% uh, when 10% uh, of the graphene oxide was in. So basically, it's just you know the graphene oxide is adding to the weight here. Well, it's not, um, uh, the PC is not very flammable itself. It extinguishes in 14 seconds. That makes it a B1. D1, it's not a D0, which is what we're looking for. Uh, decrease the self extinguishing time to four seconds and no drips observed. Okay, so that means it makes a D0. So they were actually able to up, up their game and get their D0, but they didn't have to go very far. They needed four seconds. They needed four seconds to meet their D0. So that's why this is a D1, which is a great place to start. And then they were able to get non dripping and make it inflammable or make it a D0. Uh, UL 94. So that was pretty cool. Zero is zero from zero ten seconds. Uh, no, it's not zero seconds. It's just Z, B zero is the zero. is the best ranking. Uh, nothing nothing beats a B zero. Okay. Uh, so it, it doesn't drip. It self extinguishes within ten seconds both times. So you just have to keep flame on it. But if, but if you remove it from heat, it will self. Okay, so now we're going to switch into the two dimensional. So we're looking at carbon nanotubes and haloocyte, which is a natural 2D clay. And the first one we're going to talk about is carbon nanofibers. Okay, in this result, we have polyimide 11. Again, so we have 11, uh, 11 carbons between the, uh, each nitrogen in the chain. And again, it's just a single. They did it with a twin screw extruder. And then they wanted to use these for selective laser sintering and added them in there. So basically, they wanted as a powder that they can hit it with the laser and melt it together and fuse it together. So they wanted it to be flame resistant so that they could just do the fusing without flame. Okay. And then they saw it uh, to enhance the thermal and flame retardancy properties, an intermittent flame uh, retardant additive was used. Uh, and that was these things right here, the XO lip. And there's three of them that they used for that. So this is an additive on top of having the carbon nanofibers in it. Okay. And I want to say that these are uh, phosphate ester based flame retardants. Okay. So what they saw was that the decomposition temperature is at about 50% maximum. So that's what they said is what is the temperature? 50% of mass loss. And so they wanted to look at that. And when they saw that the higher decomposition temperatures were those that were reinforced with carbon nanofiber only. So the flame retardant thing was helping them. Only the carbon nanotubes work. And again, the reason probably is that it's transferring heat out into the hole and making it less likely. The uh, third one, though, had a uh, synergistic effect with the carbon nanotubes. And actually lowered the decomposition temperature, you know, raised the decomposition temperature, temperature at fifty percent of the weight loss by sixty-six degrees. Okay, so it went from three hundred to three hundred and sixty-six. So that's a significant change. So there's something about this additive right here, this additive number three, 
in the carbon energy that's work synergistic with each other. That was the only combination that had that large a change. Other than two, was smaller. Okay, so let's go to a PMMA system here. So they uh, kind of admitted that when they were doing their PMMA that they got one of the systems with pretty good dispersion and one of the systems with pretty bad dispersion. So they admitted that they actually saw differences in, in the systems. And then they also did polypropylene, uh, polybutadiene, polyethylene, all with multiball carbon nanoscopes. And their results from that are here. So in the PMMA system right here with the carbon, with the single ball carbon nanoscopes here, the one with good dispersion has that great, nice flat uh, curve that we're looking for in our heat plots. But the poor dispersion and the pure polymer itself both have fairly high uh, rates of like uh, 1300, where this one has the uh, peak was around 550. So we had about you know, a significant cut in half of the maximum rate. And this was kind of at a low heat flux, uh, usually it was 50. So this is kind of low, but it still was able to onset fairly quickly and reduce its voltage. But again, plateau out with our well dispersed nanotubes. Oops. All right. And then when we did that with the higher heat flux, so this is the higher heat flux of 50, what we saw was that the one and two for point five percent and one percent of the single one contracts both gave us this nice low plateau right here. Uh, but the other ones with the poorly dispersed systems and the PMA didn't look. So that's showing you really, really interestingly that the dispersion gave it a really good result in PMA. Now, of course, the other problem is if you were looking at your PMA for transparency, you just lost it all by adding even point. Five percent is enough to really haze it down quite a bit. One percent gets you almost, you know, down to like five percent transmission. So you have dark sunglasses. So in the polypropylene, uh, the poly, uh, the poly, uh, this is the polypropylene system right here. When they did that same thing with the uh, polypropylene, polybutadiene, and polyethylene group here, compared with their systems, they did the same thing where they did carbon nanotube at about 1%, and they saw a definite decrease. These aren't as pretty a curve, but I think they're scrunched in. If they actually pull them out like that, you'll see, look, peak go down, peak go down. So in all of these cases, so that means they were able to do this in not only their PMA system, but they were also able to do it in three other focal polymers to show the same trend. So that's really good. That's a really good result because Four polymer systems all show basically the same trend. They get that plateau and they spread it. There's a typo on there. Well, yeah, that one. The legend is correct. But, uh, yeah. The, the legend is incorrect, but the script is correct. Yeah, these are incorrect, but this should be correct. Right. It, it's in the book that way. <laughs> so. Okay, so that's a good one because, uh, but again, it has the, an issue where it's actually trying to transfer heat into the bulk. So it might onset slower, but it might still burn completely. So let's trans go to one that doesn't transfer heat very well, holoacite. So holoacite is a, is a tubular clay. Uh, we're going to use uh, polyamide 11 again, and, it's, and then conventional of uh, FR additives. And it's an intermescent one, so that's it's probably a phosphate. System. Uh, they did a matrix of nine formulations with this, including the flame retardant and the oocyte nanotubes right here. They increased concentration of 10%, and they were able to achieve a, 90, a 94 V0. Uh, I believe it was the last two years of KO2 in non, uh, uh, non dripping system. But the other thing is you have nylon, which usually has an elongation of about 100. 20% when it pulls right here, even at the highest load age, they still got 40% elongation of break. So they didn't ruin all of their mechanical properties when they were doing it at 10%. They got their D4, they didn't, they still have some elongation, it's a little tougher, but they didn't ruin all the properties and they can brittle even at the stem. So that's actually really good. 
So overall, they had a very good, um, uh, they didn't do um, any of the heat that was sent. They did do, get, they didn't ruin their mechanical properties, which is really cool. So they did actually get them fairly well dispersed. Right here, you can see that overall, um, the uh, nanotubes are more of these things. And this seems to be the flame retardant. That the flame retardant looks like it's probably going to be one of those. Uh, I don't know what they did. They didn't say actually before. I, I would have to go get the article. Okay. All right, questions on 2D. So that's really all, the only 2D we have. We have carbon nanofibers, uh, multi wall carbon nanotubes, single wall carbon nanotubes, and fluoroxide. Everything else is in the three yeah. Just coincidence that they're all using the same I assume it has something to do with the, the fact that, that they, they want to use it in a, in a fiber or a it's used in like the compression molded boxes and stuff a lot. So they're probably trying to increase the fiber. Okay, so we're going to go over to the three dimensional ones. And the three dimensional ones, that's where we're going to see the hydroxides and like the nanosilica and all the other. So the first one we're going to do is PMMA with nanosilicon right here. And the nanosilicon has this especially huge surface area, right? Because if you have like 20 micron, I'm sorry, 20 nanometer particles, you're looking at like 600 uh, uh, cubic meters per gram. I'm sorry, square meters per gram surface area. So that, uh, so, you know, as the smaller the particle, the more surface area it has, right? So that gives it down, so that by the time you get into the nanometer range, you have a huge surface area that's getting uh, they noted that there was no uh, improvement in the limited oxygen index at the 10% nanosilica, even all the way down to seven nanometers size. So the limiting oxygen uh, index, uh, the silica just didn't help. It didn't transfer it and reflect heat or something. Um, but when you use larger particles, larger particles here, it did increase it from 36 to 44. That's a significant increase. Anything more than five points is a significant five percent oxygen. And so they didn't see that it affected the UL94 rate. So it's interesting because you would expect, uh, oh, wait, hold it, they're spherical. They don't add to the mechanical properties of your system. They're not going to change or melt. They're not going to change your mechanical property because they're spherical. And so it would still be a low. So if they had a, a higher persistence length or a platiness to them, that would that would inhibit some flow. Might inhibit some flow. But if we look at the um, the heat release rate here, PMMA by itself actually has pretty interesting. Uh, Barber notice that it kind of like it'll kind of bubble and crackle and sizzle, and that's why it kind of flattens out. But it still has a very high release rate. These have a nice peak and then come down slowly, which is a great curve. Even these are all at 13% right here. So we have nice reproducibility on the heat release curves, with the peaks being very, very minimally above 600, which is about half of the system. Yeah. So now moving on to nano aluminum. Nano alumina, not aluminum. This nano aluminum, nano aluminum would burn in this case. So it would actually hurt. So they have these three ones that they call exo needle. And I had a hard time finding a needle. Why they call it that. Uh, and then slightly bigger and, uh, and slightly more homogeneous in size. It's like about the same. Means a, a very high polydispersity in their size. Okay. And then they, they process it by twins through extrusion. So you know it's going to be good. They did 10 formulations of the different thing plus me. And then we're injected molded into the testing. So when they do the UL that's a long strip like that, injection molded for that. When you do the um, the heat release, uh, the cone calorimetry, it actually has to be uh, 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters by preferably 20 millimeters. It needs to self-support. 
Some of the problems with those is that if they have too much heat flux, it will actually melt and rip. You have to hold it up with a metal screen. It changes the results slightly. Okay, so they got pretty good dispersion here in their system. This is all the systems. Uh, these are uh, all at 5% of the four of the three different materials that they use. So they got decent dispersion, which we expected from a twin screw extruder. And then here are their results on decomposition temperature. So, and luckily they've done the math for you. They've done the delta T. And so any of them, the one that seems to be the one is the needle seemed to have the highest change in decomposition temperature, the first now. So the second one had a reasonable amount, but it was about the same as the third. So there's something about that material there, uh, either it has a different structure or maybe it does have needles in it somewhere, we can see them, but uh, it definitely has a, a greater impact on the system. So nanomaterial, you know, just even the grade of your nanomaterial can affect the decomposition. Did the orientation of the needles really matter? Um, they, didn't, they didn't order them at all. It was, it was dispersed, it, it's however it came out of the extruder. And, and then the top one, I mean, I don't see any high aspect ratio of systems. I mean, this one looks very similar to that one. But you're just supposed to build the computer, right? Huh? But you're just supposed to build the three. That's why there's this kind of change in density. Because mm. these look about the same as this first, and the first one up there is the one that's the, the one that had the biggest change. I don't see a significant difference in dispersion. You see the third, third one and the fifth one. Uh -huh. There is a difference, right? Right, but these are these are the same. They're just this is just a bigger range. Yeah. These are just higher. So this is higher magnification. So comparing this set right here in between this set, they look about the same. In between this set, this one doesn't look as good, but maybe it does have a lower. Maybe it is lower source, but this one looks fairly similar. That one actually did best. Significantly so further testing on that. Oh, we already did that. Okay. So now let's look at the TGA curves that they got this from. So the material itself, you know, actually starts decomposing fairly early here and has zero charge here. And then as we increase our content of our, uh, I mean, as we have our different components here, this actually takes out the most. But notice this one actually has the highest charge. So, and this one has almost no charge right here, down to 2%. So the, the polymer burned off completely on this one. These, the polymer had to remain fixed above the 2.5%. So this isn't just the nanomaterial. This is some of the polymer char influence creating char out of the organic. So that's kind of a significant as well, but I would consider this up say ten percent. So that means that they somehow bound to seven point five percent of the organic material. And then let's look at the okay. And so and that's at ten degrees a minute, and then this is at five percent. So at five percent, we see a similar trend right here. So they kind of all start to decompose about the same. Again, if it's significantly bigger than our neutral here, and we have a lower charge yield at the faster rate, which is unusual. You expect the faster you do the charge, the better. But this is where we still have less than, actually, this looks like 5% right here. And only the needle one had a significant amount of damage. And then this is under nitrogen. Now, under nitrogen, you'd expect a lot of polymer systems to char by themselves. Okay. So, uh, the aromatic system, the flame resistant polymer I'm working on now, under nitrogen, it had like a 65% char dissipation. Okay. So, that would be like here. <laughs> so, in this system here, though, the poly, uh, it's an aromatic, I'm sorry, it's an allotonic polyamide. And it burns out to just basically no more than where our silicon was. 
So with actually adding more, it's not helping us with our char yield. Our char yield is now approaching with our filler pumps. So uh, it's not the whatever synergistic synergistic effect we found before is not helping. Okay. So then when they looked at the UL tests on both the first and second burn, all of them drained. Okay. So, and then when they went to continue, uh, they had B2s right here and everything else failed. Okay. The B2 also means that when you have your drip, uh, you drip and then catch a cotton fire. If you drip and don't catch a cotton fire, you can be a B2. That means that you're, you're melting your, your little uh, piece of polymer is still burning when it. Uh, if you drip at all, a single drop, a single drip of polymer coming off, and that comes as a drip. So that's that's actually you want to know where. And that's B zero. If you get if you get two nos, you get a B zero. If you get uh, if you get a no yes, that's like a B one. As long as you don't catch the thing on fire. Yes, yes. You get a you get a B two or a fail if you catch the fire. The, the actual rank like on the third column doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, drip rank, I don't know. That's just a check too. How is the drip? Like uh, uh, maybe it's it. Oh, maybe it drips three times. That's not one. In the first one, one it's, it's a the rank. first one. It's, it's rank. rank. Yeah. It's three. So and then the I mean, it's also three. Yeah. So all the three failed. So they must have dripped a lot. Uh, <laughs> two, one, two passed, but the other two failed. Yes, yeah, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> they didn't. Uh, I don't. I think the fail means that it combusted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so it, it, if it drips a lot and can't have a bad breath dripping and then it fails too. Yeah, that makes sense. So, oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I forgot about that. Okay. So now let's switch over to that cooling effect, that endothermic reaction. Most of the ones we have are looking at char or looking at some kind of barrier or reflecting energy back. Here we're actually going to have an anemic hydroxide uh, or hydrate, anemic hydrate as well, uh, actually absorbing heat from the system. Now, usually, if you have um, large particles, uh, two to five micron particles, you have to load it really high. So, because it doesn't have a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, water in it, so you have to have a whole bunch of it in there. Screwed enough water to cool the system down um, to make them, you know, the fire return. So let's try nano. Hey, you know, macro doesn't work. Let's try nano, right? So let's go. Oh, and the system they're using is a little bit different. It's a co polyethylene vinyl acetate. So, vinyl acetate, if you clip those off, that's a polyvinyl alcohol or flute. And this is actually a little less, a little more hydrophobic than that. So it's it's a blocky copolymer. Okay, so um, I wouldn't have published this one right here. This is showing our nano filler in our matrix. I think that's a very bad dispersion. Yeah. <laughs> so I would have tried to look for something where there's just one of the smaller ones by itself. You know, and this is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. So it is. It's looked like in a petrol yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like I might say a hundred nanometers. Yeah. Yeah. That's so bad. Yeah, that the bar is a hundred nanometers. So that's a big clump. That's a huge clump. Okay. So let's look at what they got. They got it dispersed, maybe not very well, but they got it dispersed here. And they do see that the micro here actually uh decomposes early. It has a weight loss early. But actually, weight loss isn't necessarily a decomposition, right? Because we're supposed to be giving off water to cool the system down. And it's giving off weight earlier. So that might be a benefit to us, right? And then they both at the 500 mark is when they stop there. So what they're looking for is a lot of people actually did what's the uh, mass loss to 500. And that's a common way to look at thermal stability because we have to go to an intermittent temperature rise. But we see that we get a little bit of mass loss earlier on and at a lower temperature. So that could be good, could be bad. Okay. Now, when they actually uh, 
did a freeze fracture on these and looked at them, they actually saw that the uh, micro stuff was clumpy and stuff like this. And again, this is a five micron bar. This is a five micron bar. And these were not dispersed very well. The particles were these little things here, but notice how these are um, really rough around the edges. So the, the matrix did not infuse into those large particles and did not separate them out very much. Okay. So we have uh, that that was probably their best dispersed particle that they saw. So we have a dispersion problem here. And that's at 26 weight percent. Okay. So and then uh, the it is uh, the the EVA ethylene violene copolymer. Uh, I want to say copolymer. So let's see. So this was the storage modulus as a function of test factor. So remember, this is a, uh, a T uh, DA dynamic uh, D TA dynamic thermal analysis. So they're oscillating the material as they change the temperature. So in the case of this, our nanomaterial here is up here. Our micron size material is here. So what we see is the nanomaterial is actually helping with the storage modulus. And notice it's in relative storage modulus it's increasing as you go up in temperature. Okay. So it's like they're breaking it apart, it's actually giving it some physical support. The micron here does not improve it very much. And again, your polymer pair would be this one right here. This is a relative. So this is uh, two above it, and this is four above it. Okay. All right, so, so that kind of helped a bit. So let's look at the physical properties too. Did we help us at all? So the original material has this nice stress strain curve. So it's kind of a soft material. And it's kind of pulling out really elongating until over a thousand percent strain. So it's really nice stretchy material here. With the micro size here, we get a little bit of added uh, modulus to the system right here. And with the nano, we have the most added modulus to the system. And they're all, you know, have their peak stress. Uh, it's not as improved at that thousand percent strain rate. So they actually did improve the physical property, and they did improve somewhat the, the you know, because of the storage modulus and the, the regular modulus here. Yeah, Might have been a little. I think it would have been better. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the limiting oxygen index values for these materials. So when we looked at this, this is all the 20% story. And normally you would have these loaded to 50, 60, 70%. So this is a fairly low value for this. The limiting oxygen index is just about atmospheric right here at 23 for the meat material. Really significant improvement, about 5% uh, percent oxygen is significant improvement for the micro. But the nano did not help as much. It only raised it by 2% oxygen. So we're seeing that, you know, we did improve its physical properties, but we really didn't help its burn, some of its burning properties. Okay. Okay. And then if we look at it in, the, in nitrogen, in nitrogen, what you're looking at is you're looking for that thermal decomposition, not necessarily burn. Okay, so you're looking for the thermal decomposition, it gives us a, um, a non oxygen thermal decomposition. So you don't have to have oxygen. The other one is therm a thermal oxidative degradation. So this is just them breaking apart into smaller molecules and all of that can happen. So when we have it with the system here, the pure polymer is actually completely gone by 500 C, but both of the filled polymers are. Just about twenty six percent. So basically, that's the filler. So yeah, really but in air, right here, if we use air here, we see a faster drop off and decomposition here. We get all the way down to zero, and about a little less than twenty six percent. That's because you gave off some water during that system. There's water being given off. Actually, there should be. These went down to zero. You actually see a little water drop. Off. But then this is where a whole bunch of water is getting off and the polymers are breaking. And then you have the 
dehydrated magnesium oxide system. All right, so then they did a static test. So this is where they put it in the uh, TGA and just held it at a constant temperature and looked for the residue. I want to say that they held it at 430 degrees. So here's the rise of the temperature to the set temperature, which is 433. You immediately see, as soon as you turn it on, you start getting decomposition approximately seven minutes in. And then based on the number of <coughs> what you, your conditions are, your, your filler, you can change the curve a little bit. So in nitrogen, that's the upper curves here. They were more stable. They had about 40% weight retention in nitrogen. And we have our nano filler actually has about 30% weight retention, about 25% weight retention, and we have 10% weight retention of pure retention itself in air. So we have nitrogen in air. So in this case here, we're creating again fewer volatiles that are uh, combusting in our nitrogen atmosphere. So overall, I mean the, this the there's some pluses and minuses to that, but I think their problem lies in the fact that they had poor dispersion. Okay. So then they actually looked at the surface of these materials after they did this. Yeah. And on the surface of this, you see that you have, um, uh, you know, some char, some hole, some burn right here. In this one, they had a huge layer of a white solid all over the surface. Now that's what we would want to see for a char ring, right? But we're using the endothermic process for this. So it should be just giving off water. Okay. So in the case here, they said that the surface was covered with something other than a meat. So there's something weird happening. Giving a good layer. And then, like these pockets are probably where the magnesium hydroxide was. And then it kind of flowed out. Okay. I thought I wrote it. They, they had some comment about it, why it wasn't what it was. No, that's not that. Okay. Okay. So maybe I have it here. So the mechanical testings. Uh, Revealed that decreased particle size does enhance reinforcement. So we saw it definitely with that um, with the magnesium hydroxide in that high surface area, which we've seen before. Uh, it also demonstrated that it affects the thermal stability of this, the, the EVA significantly. The nanomaterial, the, the effect of the endothermic composition was considerably weakened, most probably by the catalytic effect of the high surface area. So you're giving off water earlier, even when you don't want to give off water. Okay. And then, then the thermal decomposition is uh, As a result, untreated nanofiller showed less effective flame comparison to the micro filler. And the micro filler still use it very low. Okay. I want to focus on here. And perfect again. Uh, that's my last slide for this one. Part two will come next week. I mean, I'm sorry, on Wednesday. All right, I'm going to stop recording and.